It's three o'clock. Yes, it is. That means you and me are going to, well, mostly you, are going to tell everyone watching how to uh, pitch your games to Paradox. Correct. Uh, Because, I mean, we all do different things at uh, Gamescom. I'm I'm streaming. You're in a lot of meetings. Yes. And some of those are uh, companies pitching their games to Paradox. Absolutely. Actually, most of them are. Uh Oh, and... And Fred is trying Fred to. Fred, our great leader. You need to. Tr- oh, you. Oh, need he's the trying phone. to stab someone. Oh, right. Fred couldn't get into his room, so he borrowed my room. Come and say hi, Fred. We're live on that camera. Uh, hi there, on that camera. I just need the key card. <laughs> so go to my room and he'll get the thing. The glamorous. We'll life talk to you tomorrow, Fred. Of working at a PC publisher. Um, right. Uh, so before we start, I'm going to actually introduce myself. You should. For the uh, the people in the audience that are actually not familiar with me. Hi everyone. My name is Shams. I've worked at Paradox soon now, seven years. I've uh, done a bunch of things at Paradox, but what I've been doing the past few years is to manage our games portfolio, and I'm in charge of finding and signing uh, new games. So some of the biggest, most colossal failures in the company history, that's my, <laughs> that's my fault. And some of the <laughs> more successful titles, uh, maybe I was involved at some stage also. But my, my job here at uh, Gamescom is to go... It starts at 10 in the morning. I have 30-minute meetings back-to-back from 10 to 6 in the evening. And I do this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, yep. Thursday, Friday. Thank you. So new meetings every 30 minutes, and we sit down with somebody that pitches a game. Um, and uh, it, it, so I, I, we look at a lot of pitches. And that's the only thing we do. And then we go back and then we try to remember what we looked at and the th- stuff that was interesting. We try to follow up and see if it's something for us. And this is basically how we find new games. That's a part of it. A lot of people also email and send us stuff. So a big part of my job is looking at a lot of, lot of different um, game pitches all day long. So naturally, when you look at about 600 pitches every year, you become quite... I wouldn't say I'm good at it, but you, you become better at spotting what not to do when mm-hmm. you're pitching a game. Uh, so we have a few um, standard tips that I try to dispense when we talk to people. Uh, and we've got a bunch of questions that we yep. can go through. I don't know if anyone in the chat actually has pitches, but we can actually, you know, I'll dispense some of the, uh, some of the tips. And then if you guys want to put together a few high-level pitches, we can take it from there. I'll start with a few disclaimers. An idea, this is the first disclaimer, an idea is worth nothing in this industry. Ideas are a dime a dozen. I could go to Yuan or the development studio or uh, our good friend here and people have hundreds of ideas and ideas that are pretty good. But an idea is completely worthless unless you can also bring it to life. If you can actually code or have a team or somebody who's making it or you can create a mod. So that's the first, you know, depressing fact about pitches. but that's that's really where it is. But let's let's start. Um, the most important thing, or a big aspect of a pitch, either if you're doing it face to face, or if it's on paper, is the elevator pitch. And for those of you that are not aware of what an elevator pitch is, so imagine I get 600 pitches every year. I really don't want to hear any pitches, right? Sometimes I get tired of pitches. I just don't want any more pitches. And you're a game developer, and you want to pitch to me. And I've been dodging you all Gamescom, and mm-hmm. I really don't want to hear your pitch because I'm so tired and just want to go home and watch the invitational games that I haven't seen yet. I get into the elevator, the doors are about to get closed, and that's when you jump in using your dexterity plus 18. So you jump into the elevator, and you're like, oh, it's you, Shams. I have a great idea for you. And like, I'll do my best not to roll my eyes. And I'll just smile and I'll say, sure. Because what am I going to do? I'm stuck in that elevator, yeah. right? And it's a 30-second ride. It's a slow-ass elevator. And during those 30 seconds, you have the chance to convince me that this is actually a pretty damn good idea. So I, I can't turn off my brain. I'm going to listen to you. So how do you create a compelling elevator pitch that takes about an elevator ride in time to explain? Um... And there are several ways of going about it, but obviously it has to be short and succinct, and it has to get the message across. One of the most common mistakes I see when people uh, pitch games is that they take a long-ass time in explaining what it is, 
or you know they might send it to me a pitch to us and say they actually get in touch with us and say we have a great idea but we want to pitch it face to face we don't want to we don't want to yeah. send you paper and i say unless you can s describe make it sound compelling in a sentence or less or two sentences you're not going to make it even if you make it past me because you're not going to go home to every single person you are selling the game to and convince them to you know actually if you once you get into the third act there are several game mechanic layers it by that point you kind of lost them right so so you have to find uh find a succinct way of doing it and there's no you know real formula of doing it but you can use shortcuts you can absolutely and this is this is a pitch i got just an elevated pitch i got yesterday and they just pitched it like this it's ftl meets pirates of the caribbean i'd play that yes and immediately if you've played ftl yeah which you should of course mm -hmm. And then if you're familiar with pirates, you can like, eh, I see where this is going. You got your crew, you're roaming around, you're finding treasure, the other bad, big bad ships, you're doing a bit of fighting and stuff like that. And then, boom, you kind of understand it. Of course, in this case, it's, it's extra good because there's a clear competitor and there's a clear audience that you're going after. So you can kind of, you know, nail it in. If somebody, if you're pitching it to somebody and they haven't played FTL, that's fine because they're probably not the audience. But yeah. my job as a as the business guy is to be understand. If you say it's Metal Gear Solid, plus, uh, you know, uh, Red Dead Redemption, I'll understand it. Even though I've already played one of the games, I understand what the Metal Gear games bas basically do. So, and, and of course, uh, many somebody mentions, well, that game already exists. Well, every idea more or less exists. And the cool thing about this industry is that. A game might, somebody might have the idea, it might actually only be released, but that might not matter, because if nobody's played it, or it hasn't sold well, it doesn't really exist in the minds of most people. Um, so that's, that's, that's a good starting point, just use um, a known entity, and just add a mix to it. Yeah. The, the biggest mistake you can do in design, generally, is to reinvent the wheel. Do not be too creative. Just take something that somebody else made that actually works and just change it slightly. You know, add a spoke to the wheel or add rims to it or whatever. Uh, do the uh, kind of equivalent. Um, so that that's the basic mm -hmm. starting point for what I'd say. Have a very succinct way of describing what uh, what your game would be. Um, one of the um, one of the reasons why I think City Skylands was a uh, a good success is that. Most of us had a very good understanding of what the game was because it had a strong vision that was also kind of the elevator pitch for the game, which was City Skylines is a modern take on a classic city builder. Yeah. And that could have been the elevator pitch for the game. And mm -hmm. it just, I think, it, I think it was also somewhat of the consumer promise as well, right? Uh, but sometimes, of course, you make games that are harder to describe than FTL. Yeah. Right, there might be abstract concepts. I mean, how do you, how do you describe what the Stanley Parable is? Yeah, I'm, I, and I, I was thinking about the same thing. If you're, if you're the guy who comes up with, for example, like the first in a genre, that's yeah, where they, it's how do you explain Minecraft without saying Minecraft? Exactly, exactly. Uh, I mean, what, what was the crafting genre before Minecraft, right? So, but then again, you can use real-world references. It's a digital Lego game. Yeah, you could call it that. Uh, somebody in the in the forums asked me. Yeah, let's see. We let's see. For, for those that missed it, we uh, I posted a thread on the forums, so we have some questions there, and we're gonna look at that and uh, answer the s some most of those. And there's a lot of noise in the background. Hopefully, it's not coming right. through on stream too, too sure. badly. Sure. So, the letter Z, which is Zeke, yeah. back in the office, our community manager, he asked. What's the elevator pitch for your dream game? And it's a, it's a, kind of hard for me to answer that. I have many dream games. But the one I come back to over and over is TIE Fighter Collector CD-ROM. That's specific edition of the game. Uh, and the dream pitch, in one way, for me personally, would be if somebody said, I want to make a modern take on the classic TIE yeah. Fighter. That would be amazing. So it has a campaign, and then you add a couple of new things because it's a, mm -hmm. an updated formula. That would be cool. But if... The, the ideal pitch for Paradox, right now, you know, Paradox makes 
games in basically three genres. Strategy games, RPGs, and management simulation games. Those are the three areas we're in right now. We've done a bit of action games in the past, but right now we're just doing those three. Maybe we'll add a fourth and a fifth leg t to the equation and down the line. Um, but th that's basically what we're making. Right now, right, right this moment, what I'm hoping that my next meeting will actually pitch me is basically a game that starts with theme and ends in tycoon. Ooh, uh, yeah, huh? So uh, all those cool kind of games that EA and uh, Bullfrog. Bullfrog did, basically anything that Peter Molyneux touched <laughs> up until, you know, yeah. Fable yeah. would be very cool for us. Uh, the problem is that, of course, there are very few developers out there that can make management games or tycoon games. They're quite tricky to make. And to be frank, as a developer, you generally want to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. So you want to pitch stuff that people will buy. And if you're pitching stuff that Paradox is buying, then you're probably not pitching something that anyone else is buying because we do so weird things. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know. But I mean, just just to reiterate what you said about the pillars, basically, if, if, I, uh, if I came to you and said, Shams, mm. Super Smash Brothers, in space. I would say that sounds cool, but it's not for us. Yeah, exactly. So, so so on top of those three genres, you could come to us with an RPG or in a strategy game and um, or a management game, and it still wouldn't be a good fit for Paradox because we have something called the Paradox Pillars. Could we get them up on the screen? We have I don't know. If you have them, I can I can add if you add them on that screen, I'll add the screen to the stream in a bit. Okay. Go to paradoxinteractive.com. Not Plaza. Uh, oh crap! German keyboard. Yeah. There we go. So our company, uh, the Paradox Formula. Yeah. So no, we don't have it here. Our business game pillars. Here we go. Yeah. Can I get me, this up. Yeah, I can. Let me. By the magic. Uh, well, I, I don't know how much magic it's going to be, but yes, let's uh, let's try and get a. So a capture up right these there. are what we call the core paradox pillars. These are the guiding principles behind any paradox game. So, uh, the first pillar is we want the games to be replayable. We want you to be able to play the games for hundreds, if not thousands, of hours. Going to put it straight over me. That often means that we're creating some kind of sandbox game, right? The second pillar is that we want the games to be hardcore, and we want them to be intellectually hardcore. Lining up a 360 no-scope headshot, that's fine and dandy, but that's not necessarily our type of high hardcore. Mm -hmm. uh, thirdly, uh, we tend to f favor function over form. What makes the game pretty is not the graphics necessarily, but the cool gameplay in between. And, you know, uh, obviously off of the top three first ones, you can see that the Grand Strategy ga games nail these perfectly. You can play them for thousands of hours. They're very intellectual, very hard to play. Mm -hmm. And um, they don't look like shit, but you know, graphics is not the focus of the game, yeah. although we have been adding stuff. They are looking prettier. by the. They're looking much prettier compared to how they looked a couple of years ago. But it's, uh, graphics is a means to an end. It's not the end itself. For me, the most fail moments is when you read on Reddit or NeoGAF or some other site where people have long threads and discussions about is the game in 1080p and 60 fps that's the kind of moment where you failed horribly mm -hmm. and it it people stop talking about gameplay and it's just pixels and it doesn't really matter it's all it means to an end right so the paradox grand strategy games really nailed these amazingly and then we have three additional ones uh the and the fourth one is something that we've added quite recently and it's the accessibility and the idea is that if you're making these hardcore games and you can play for hundreds of hours, you better make them easy to get into because you can get more people into them and they stay longer. And that's why you've seen probably the learning curve for a game like Stellaris is yeah. a vastly different compared to, say, Hearts of Iron 3, which was a nightmare to get into. The fifth pillar is that it's we want to favor creativity. So we're creating these sandbox games with a f bunch of fun tools and sand to play around in, and we want you to create different things. In City Skylines, you're creating a skyline, or a city, or something beautiful, or actually modding stuff. In, our, in Crusader Kings, you're crafting a story. Yeah. In Pillars of Eternity, or Tyranny, you're crafting your story, you're telling you a kind of tale. 
And finally, we have something that's called highly engaging subject matter, which is corporate speak for stuff you can nerd out about. Yeah. World War Two, you can play the game. You can go back and then you can read about guns and flak 88s for hours, then come back into the game and have an understanding of how the logics behind that actually works. Another great example of a game that does this is Kerbal Space Program, which is not a paradox game, but it hits all of these quite hard, and especially on the last part. I can play Kerbal for five hours, and then I can sit and read about the Apollo program and be amazed, and then I go back into the game and I have a better experience thanks to you know uh, that kind of knowledge. So, coming back to the question, what's a perfect pitch for Paradox? It's a game that either is a strategy management or RPG game, or a mix of, so a RPG management game or a strategy RPG, mm -hmm. that also do these quite well. It's a game that has a ton of replayability, has a ton of depth, it's hardcore. It, you're spending most of your development resources on creating systems rather than content or graphics or writing. Um, it's easy to get into, but hard to master in some ways. It fosters some kind of creativity and is nerdy. So that's really the you know ideal uh, paradox game. And so the genres, the pillars, and the third factor which makes it very exciting to us, of course, is if somebody comes to us and says, I love IP X. They say, I love Crusader Kings. I have a great idea for a Crusader Kings game. And they can refer back to, you know, events and inside jokes from CK and have a good understanding of it and have an idea of how to bring that to life in different ways. So those are the best, you know, the yeah. apps. You have the, the best possible starting position for an elevator. When you're in that elevator mm -hmm. with me, I'll immediately perk up if you say management strategy or RPG. Th that's the first thing, yeah. right? And if you then talk about, you know, what, what's important for us is that the game's replayable and that you get to put your mark and tell a story. Already I'll be like, hmm, maybe we should press the stop yeah. button. <laughs> and then we'll start talking about how much you love one of our IPs and what your vision is for, for that IP, right? So that would be an amazing starting point. And it doesn't necessarily, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, but, you know, the core concept of CK, which is about, you know, getting your dynasty to survive throughout the ages is something that transcends, you know, the grand strategy map yeah. that we're looking at. We could absolutely do a, there was a game released just the other day by Devolver uh, called Reigns, mm -hmm. which has some similar mechanics. Uh, the roguelike, uh, uh, Rogue Legacy. Yes, has also some kind of generational mechanics. So there, there are different ways to take the core of what our different IPs are and take them and do them in different ways. You could, for instance, you know, pitch us. And we're also interested in you. You know, we do PC games, but we're also interested in mobile games and console games and areas where we kind of haven't been yet. If you come to me and say, I want to make a great management game, which is basically a modern take on Sim Tower. Mm -hmm. The old classic. Yeah. But it's modernized. It's based on the city's IP. Or even, you know, it's a mashup between CK and Sim Tower, where, where you're building this giant tower that eventually will topple because it's medieval engineering. But you have to manage the people in there. Right? Uh, so, in its most basic form, you've got to come up with a good idea. Then, the, of course, the next big part of it is that is this even feasible to make? Mm hmm. Uh, what it, will it cost? Can it make money? Uh, and this is why the biz, the work at least is pretty hard. So we look at 600 pitches. About 90% of them we immediately say no because it's not strategy management or RPG. Um, then the remaining 10% we look at them and say, okay, is this something that can make money? Can the developer actually deliver on what they're promising? Um, uh, and uh, does it fit with our overall plans? So, uh, somebody asks, what does IP refer to? IP is short for intellectual property. So, Star Wars is an int intellectual property. It's, it's a brand, essentially. Uh, and please jump in if I keep using industry terms. Remember, I'm in the middle of a conference. All yeah. we do is talk about industry terms and stuff. Um, so, let's, let's do a couple of questions. We're seeing a ton of uh, cool questions. Um, um, do, 
somebody asked, do we do IP? And I mentioned this before. Do we do projects on other people's IP? And we do not touch other people's IP. Uh, we, we do it on extremely rare occasions. Uh, the most recent, recent example would be Pillars of Eternity. It's fully owned by Obsidian. They paid for the game, they developed the game, they made the game, and they came to us to help them with the parts that they don't like doing themselves, which is marketing. But if it's something that we're funding, we're probably we're going to own the IP uh, because we want to work long term. So, of course, why don't we just make a modern take on, why don't we just do Sim Tower? Well, of course, EA owns the, the mm -hmm. Sim brand, and uh, they're not selling anytime soon, and we probably couldn't afford it anyway. Um, so it should be about, you know, th and that's why, you know, Star Trek, Star Wars, these things will never really happen because our basic philosophy is that we always would rather spend money and time on ourselves and our brands rather than build somebody else's brand. I'm absolutely sure that we could create a pretty kick-ass grand strategy game set in the 40K universe, right? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Well, I, I was going to say yes, please, but I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Uh, we could absolutely do that, and I think it would be really fun, but... We're not interested in, in building IP for yeah. anyone else. We want to build our own IP. Uh, and the reason for that is that we always try to build things long term. Building IP for somebody else is always for a short term gain. We sell a lot, but we want to build long term in almost everything that we do. Um, but, but also, Paradox is right now in a position where uh, we're entertaining pitches on every kind of things. You, Anyone has an idea for a CK board game? Go right ahead, pitch that to us. How do you pitch it? I don't know. Right now, what people do when they want to pitch us board games is that they send us a prototype of their board game. Um, we did a we licensed Magica to Ethan in yeah. California, and he sent us a kick-ass video of himself pitching the game, and we just went for it. Right? Um, if you want to pitch a game to Paradox, there are several ways. The most easy way is to go to our website uh, and there's a form you can fill out regarding your game and you fill out a bunch of stuff and you just send it in. That's the most efficient way. Secondly, you can email new games at paradoxplaza.com. Uh, go straight to my inbox through several filters first. Um, when we look at every single pitch. The third way is to ping me over Twitter. And uh, my Twitter handle is. Uh, can we type it in the? Sure, we can. We chat? can. Pr we can probably get it up here somehow. Yeah, uh, that's one way. Uh, another way is to just ping anyone in the company in whatever form or shape or form through the Twitch chat, uh, on our forum, on Reddit. Uh, I do a shit ton of Reddit all the time, uh, and just ask, hey, I have an idea. Who do I get in touch with? And somebody will forward it to me. Um, uh, and that's, uh, somebody asked, how do you pronounce your last name? Uh, Giorgiani. Giorgiani. Right. We'd love to make a Dune game, but of course, again, unless we're buying the entire Dune IP, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, and, you know, uh, building new IP brands is incredibly hard. Um, and that's why you keep seeing so many sequels in this industry, because... It's familiar, and people rather you end up in kind of the George Bush Kerry kind of re-election situation. Do people want to take a chance with something new and unknown, or just keep going with what they're kind of familiar with, right? Um, have so I have I mentioned that I am uh, not famili too familiar with uh, German keyboards? Mm, just I think people can figure out the at. So yeah, well, let's uh, just t type it in so I don't mispronounce, and we'll put it up here. There we go. Yeah. So somebody says, I have a friend working in the company. Could I give him some info and ask if he could present it to you? We'll actually ask him to do the same thing. And it's actually, I'll tell you, it's going to be harder for somebody who works at Paradox to pitch me an idea than somebody that works uh, does, uh, that is outside the company. And I'll tell you why. And it's not that we don't listen to people internally. But if you work in the p development studio, have we had anyone up on the, in the, in the thing? Uh, it's it's going to be up uh, so shortly. If you're working with Johan or Hendrik or anyone in the in yeah. the dev team, they have their own process for how they vet ideas. And to be honest, like every single person in the company has thought about Victoria three, four, five, six. The same goes with CK 
three, four, five, six. Everyone has those. It's not like I suddenly nobody's thinking about making you know another CK. Of course we're thinking about it, but the problem is that we we've got our asses full with doing a shit ton of other stuff, right? So if somebody comes up with another idea, let's say it's a completely different idea. Let's say it's uh, let's say it's a uh, hundred year war battle simulator mm -hmm. thing that has, you know, total war elements to it where you're directing armies and setting up stuff and blah, blah, blah. Even if they have that idea and everyone loves that idea, it's still going to be like, well, how do we squeeze this in next to all the Victorias and CKs and EUs and, you know, Stellaris just came out and did amazing, right? So we're going to focus that on a long way. And it's not like I go to Johan and, and Henrik and say, guys, you're making Rome too. It doesn't work that way. Um, we firmly believe, and it, it's the same with other developers, is that we don't go to them and say, you know, you're doing this, unless they kind of feel that they want to do it. That's the best yeah. way to go about it. So uh, pitching it externally is uh, is some of the best ways to get shit done. Somebody asked me about the worst pitch I've ever gotten. We've gotten many bad pitches, and I don't want to throw anyone particular under the bus. No, I was, I was going to say, because yeah. there are like different types of bad pitches too, but from the perspective of I want to get my game published, surely the worst pitch are the ones that you don't actually remember anymore. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're completely right. There are so many pitches that are completely bland and unmemorable. Uh, the the bad, really bad, are memorable because they were so bad. Yeah. One of the time we, I mean, often we get pitches that aren't really pitches. We got somebody who wrote 17 pages of backstory in Russian. That's <laughs> which is hard for me to work with, but I did Google Translate half of the first page, and then I realized it was uh, it is a chirpy on me. It is yeah. a chirpy on me. So, it, but th th those are kind of hard to work with. My chirpy's over here. Uh, but other, I mean, bad pitches are obviously when they send the pitch to us and have CC'd every other publisher in the Western world. That's also a bad. It's not a bad pitch per se, but I'm never going to open that. It's on the, general the difference between CC and BCC. Yeah, exactly, but. <laughs> But I generally don't want to see a BCC either. Um, another bad pitch is if you completely misread Paradox. If you're just, and a lot, I understand this, a lot of developers are just looking for money, just looking for a partner. They might send over, you know, hey, I'm making a music rhythm puzzle game for the Nintendo DS. Can you guys please publish it? And like, you have no idea what we're about. Yeah. It's kind of like when you, if you, if you're applying for a job, you do your homework. You know, when the company's funded, it, how long have they been in business? What's their core business? Do a bit of research. It's the same thing. The least sexy thing is, of course, when somebody just sends in something, I have no clue who we are because we are pretty weird, right? Yeah. Pizza Tycoon would be amazing. I'm a big oh. fan of Pizza Tycoon. Did you play it? Uh, yeah, I love Pizza Tycoon. Well, I say I love Pizza Tycoon. I, I, I love the mafia part of Pizza Tycoon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the part where you're, no, I'm fed up with running a pizzeria. Let's yeah. play the other game. Yeah, so let's look up through the chat and see if there are other questions. Yeah. Uh, keep dropping questions. Um, I'll go through the forums. Uh, somebody asks, if a group or studio wants to pitch, how many people should be doing the pitch? Uh, do you mean face-to-face? -face? I, I assume it's face-to-face. -face. If, you know, if, if you made it to a meeting, I guess. It doesn't really matter. One person, two person. Just you know, make sure whoever's pitching the game can actually do the game justice. I've had examples of people who shouldn't be in front of speaking in front of other people yeah. who are doing the pitches and that just doesn't work. You don't have to be you don't have to have the lead designer pitch the game. If he's a nervous fellow or girl that doesn't like talking in front of Yeah, I mean people, that hap that happens a lot. Yeah. Make just get somebody who can talk about the game to do it. And uh often I get the question, when should we get in touch with you guys? I can tell you when the wrong time is to get in touch with us. More and more, especially due to Steam Greenlight, we get people who get in touch with us after they re release their game. They get on Greenlight, they get approved, they release the game on Steam, and then they come to us and say, eh, the game is doing quite poorly, could you help publish it? And we're like, nope, because it's too late. Because whatever we can do as a publisher, we bring to bear before the game is released. Yeah. But otherwise, you know, we've, we've started doing projects that have been basically an idea on a napkin, or they've been, you know, a... F I mean, Pillars of Eternity was more or less done when they guys, the guys came to us, right? But you should come to us at the point where you can make a compelling case. And some can make a compelling case just by a good elevator pitch, and other people need, you know, a prototype and a working thing. 
But of course, you know, one of the first questions we ask ourselves, again, because ideas are worth next to nothing, is the capacity to actually bring the idea to life. And as you, those of you that follow the games industry or follow the Kickstarter campaigns, uh, you know that it's a very, very easy to promise. It's very, very hard to deliver. Yeah. A lot of Kickstarter campaigns promise the world and they can't deliver. They fall behind. And the reason for this is that game development is bloody hard. I can be quite frank and say, out of all the projects that I've been involved in at Paradox, almost every single one has been late. One project, as far as I know, has been on time and the other ones have been kind of on time is Colossal Order uh, that delivered Cities in Motion 2. That was the project that was delivered. I think <laughs> Marina is so, she's so cocky. <laughs> they d usually you deliver a, a milestone to the publisher. The publisher looks at it and then they tell you if it's approved or not. Mm -hmm. And it, usually it isn't approved and you have to do in that second submission. The guys kind of sent it to us on like December 21st, okay? Just before the holidays and they sent it in and we're like, uh, and, and she said like, okay, we're going on vacation now. We'll be back in three weeks or something. And we we're like, um, we'll get back to you regarding that because the milestone won't be approved. And she was like, it'll be approved. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Marina, she runs a very tight ship. Um, so that really worked. Somebody asked do, if we jumped on City Skylines right away. And I'll tell you a story about that. We made Citizen Motion 1 with those guys. Uh, and then we were talking to them and we said, one day we're going to take on uh, SimCity. Essentially, we want to build a city builder, but we felt that we weren't ready as a publisher. They weren't ready as a team. The tech wasn't ready, uh, and to be honest, there was a SimCity coming out. So, like, yeah. who the who the who the fuck are we, right? Honestly, who's gonna compete with SimCity? Uh, so we said, let's probably just make another game, and one day we'll be prepared. So we started making Citizen Motion Two, and after that, we started talking about, okay, what do we do next? And SimCity was still coming out at that time, and we were like, okay, we can't take them on directly. We need to probably find our own kind of flavor to a, a SimCity game. So the original pitch for, I don't know if I showed it during a, stream, during a stream, but I could do it sometime. It was called Mayor. The original pitch for City Skylands was called Mayor, and it was more of a political. Yeah, okay. It was a city builder, but it focused a lot on that, the political stuff. Um and we liked it because it, you know, it was kind of CK-ish and mm -hmm. had a lot of diplomacy and shit like that. Uh, but it, it because we were trying to find our own kind of path with the city builder. But sometime during the process, we saw that SimCity wasn't exactly giving people what they wanted. So we kind of colossal order did a magnificent pivot, and we gave them feedback on the pitch, and we said this is not quite where it needs to be, and they pivoted and put together a fantastic pitch, and it looked gorgeous. And that's kind of when we went with uh, mm, yeah. what would then become City Skyline. I think we had some questions further up. Okay, let Twitch. me. Uh, let's, uh, so make a tycoon games. Yes, we would like to make tycoon games. No, Victoria three when uh, is it 2019? Don't don't, no, don't no. trust anything I, he says about Victoria it's not three. True. Victoria Secret. We're not gonna um, do uh, those. Well, that's, we don't that, have that IP. It's it's uh, Wiss's uh, hobby game. Star Citizen. I'm not gonna. For legal reasons, I can't comment on Star Citizen. I've already gotten hate mail over that. So you can just Google me and Star Citizen, and you'll find threads. Um, board games are cool, but it's not part of our core uh, business, of course. Uh, Dungeon Keeper Mobile from modern times. That sounds cool, but it's a bit scary. Um, uh, we, should, we should look into that. Uh, theme Park World would absolutely be cool. Uh, there are a bunch of other g people out there making cool stuff. Yeah, it seems like if you're if you're just adding like a, if you're if you're saying hey here's a good management or tycoon game, we're probably gonna agree that it would be cool to have a modern version of that. Yeah. because yeah. it would. Yeah, um, my my personal favorite is Transport Tycoon. I played the crap out of Transport Tycoon. There's there's an open source version called Open TDD. Mm -hmm. I urge you just download it and play it. It's really fun. Um, so that absolutely works. We have, um, talk, people are talking about the pitch document. We actually have, the first thing we'll send you if, if you, if you send us a pitch, what we'll immediately respond with, unless we can understand perfectly what you mean in your pitch, we will send you back a number of headlines that we, that we will ask you to fill out. And those headlines are the major points that we need to understand before we can make a business decision regarding the game. And is this something you would then send out? Like, if I managed to do a decent elevator pitch, is that at the point where I would get 
this type of uh, yeah. document. Yeah, yeah, we'll tell you. Just email me, and we'll follow up on this idea. And then, unless I, another common problem is that pitching is really hard, and a lot of people have really good ideas, and they might even have good teams, but being able to convey the idea you have in your head mm -hmm. to somebody else through paper and words is actually pretty hard. Because everyone has their own interpretation of, you know, when I say FTL meets Pirates of the Caribbean, everyone imagines the gameplay. But the part of the gameplay from FTL you might have liked was maybe the boss. Yeah. While I hated the boss, and I'm like... You the know, overworld map. Yeah, for instance. So everyone reads in their own kind of thing. So you want to, in a pitch, you need to remove ambiguity. And the problem is that sometimes we get great ideas sent to us, but it's presented in such a horrible way, and we have to kind of drag out a good pitch yeah. from developers who have no... They're good at making games, but they're not good at describing that idea to somebody else. Uh, and it, it, is, it, it, it is hard. Um, uh, Bane Williams wants to know if you uh, if you've per, uh, prefer a written uh, pitch versus, for example, a video pitch, if, if we're emailing you. Uh, both, I'd say. You have to have a written pitch. You have to have a written pitch. But if you have a video, every single video pitch goes above and beyond the Call of Duty and just really yeah. drives the hammer home. If it's a good pitch, of course. But it's, it is, uh, you know... As a video guy, don't make it too long. Yeah, no, no, no. no. You keep it short and sweet. Less is more. Uh, Caesar 3 would be amazing. If you can make a historical city builder, please... Send that pitch in. Um, Matt, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we have some uh, technical. Uh, so, what actual technical requirements do you have for a game's pitch? Basic ga game mechanics, a team, game exper design experience? So, it, I, I'm going to tell you that. If you've never s released a game before, we're probably not going to work with you. That's just the reality of yeah. it. Uh, we've reached a point in our history now that we our projects are of s uh, such a size that we can't quite gamble with some with people who have never sent uh, done stuff before even if you you are in a video game industry industry professional and have shipped games before and you have a completely new team and a new company we're still going to be skeptical because you shipping a, t a part you shipping GTA 5 with Rockstar is not the same thing as you putting together your own you know Kickstarter campaign raising money finishing a game and then pitching mm -hmm. it to us. It's just not the same. Um, uh, so, technical requirements. You know, t you need to know how to make games. You need to know how to make the type of games that we do. Uh, and you need to be able to, you know, run a company as well. Uh, that's a big part of it. We n almost never get in bed with somebody from a partner standpoint for just the sake of making one game. Uh, as with any relationship, the kind of first time you go at it it's not the best sex yeah yeah you got to work on it and it's the same with game development partnerships there's very little uh, coincidence that city skylines turned out the way it did concerning it was the third game we would mm -hmm. in colossal order we talked to each other for years we had you know we partied together cried together worked hard together we had teams that knew each other well and that facilitated the collaboration a lot, right? So uh, keeping that kind of long-term perspective, uh, it's really cool. So I'm seeing a lot of cool ideas. Dwarf Fortress meets CK, Medieval Castle Management, a Stronghold combined with CK, and a Dash of Skylines. Great ideas uh, all across. And as you can see, anyone who loves Paradox Games yeah. probably doesn't have a hard time coming up with ideas yeah. for how to tweak stuff and make them slightly different. But again, the problem is really not the ideas. You need to have people who can make the game. Well, the challenge is, of course, well, I have a day job, I can't, blah, blah, blah. Well, a, another great way to prove that you can do stuff is to create mods. Uh, creating mods is an excellent way to get into the industry, uh, g get experience, and just work. Uh, somebody asked, does Paradox have the license to Majesty? Yes, we own Majesty. Uh, we own Ma Majesty, and we're quite. Uh, Fred is the one that likes Majesty and the company. <laughs> uh, a bunch of us also like. We like the whimsical nature of the um, Majesty IP, uh, but we're. It's not on the top of our list, I'd say. Uh, and generally, if you have a great idea for a game based on one of our IPs, but you don't necessarily want to do it with Paradox, get in touch. We might give you the license, and you do whatever you want with it. Um, 
So more questions. Uh, serious question. How many devs pitching are you meeting those three days at Gamescom, and how, at what percentage would receive a call from you on Monday? So we're meeting about between. I have two other people on my team, and we have a bunch of other people in the company taking, seeing pitches. We'll see maybe 50 uh, pitches. A lot of the meetings that we have are follow-up meetings from earlier mm. pitches. Uh, out of these, if one or two games from this Gamescom, if one or two conversations that are initiated here actually result in a game that's signed, that would be considered successful. Yeah, because I feel like uh, since, since, <laughs> since I started here, one of the things I was not shocked at, well, actually mm. shocked at, was the actual amount of pitches that you guys go through compared to the amount of games that actually then yeah. get published by Paradox. Yeah. There's a lot of pitches. Yeah, I mean, we say no to 99%. 99.5% of everything we have to say absolutely no to and never see the light of day. But that re relies on two factors. First off, we, we're very picky about the type of games we do. And then secondly, it's that, you know, you might pitch me Caesar 3 and it might be perfect in a lot of ways. You might even have a track record, but we could still not end up making that game because we can't agree on the business terms uh, or the timing is entirely incorrect. Or we might not agree about, you know, you might present uh, the production plan for the game and say, you can, we can make this in 18 months. And we'll say, we, we do not believe that you can make this in 18 months. It's going to take at least 28 months. And then you re disagree and we're at an impasse because we're not going to start doing something if we have such a low... Uh, you know, belief in, in actually it yeah. being able to come to fruition. Um, uh, right. So, will there be a new Magicka project? So, can we get the pillars up again? Uh, sure. Let's let's get the pillars up again. So, let's somebody asked. What? You need to put them. On. Okay. Uh, let's see. Where are our pillars? They're over there. There we go. So, there I go. love Magicka. I started. Uh, I, you know, when I started at Paradox, I worked in marketing. My my first job was actually doing the social media uh, for the company, and I start I did most of the marketing campaign for Magic, the original one, the trailers, the tone of the thing. Uh, I was a part of that, and Magic was a huge success for us, right? Uh, but if you look at Magic and look at the pillars, let's let's measure Magic against them. The game should be replayable. Yes, Magic. Magic is a linear story game. It has a very clear story. You could replay it, and you could play it in a different style, but it's the same story. Mm -hmm. It's the same bosses. Um, there's some variation in the gameplay. Could you play it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours? Mm. No, no. If you're a big fan, but most people won't play it for hundreds of hours. You could get a lot of out of Magic in 30 hours. Intellectually at hardcore. Um, it's smart in a lot of ways. The jokes are pretty smart. The n narrative is smart, but... It's pretty twitchy, yeah. Right, you got to be f have fast reflexes, and this is why Fred, or our, our head of production, Matthias, cannot play Magicka. <laughs> if you've seen Magicka, Fred, Matthias, no. play, it's <laughs> it's it's super fun, <laughs> super old. Um, function over form. Magicka looks pretty damn good. It's yeah. very colorful. It has had as a shit ton of content. You're not connecting dots in your head when you know when in CK an event pops up about you, you know, your beautiful sister approaching you in the bedchamber mm -hmm. I mean stuff stuff yeah. you're, yeah. you're painting a picture in your head in Magicka we're painting that picture for you the game is it accessible yeah kinda it's hard hard but it's you can pick it up and start playing within minutes compared to like Arts Variant 3 creativity well it doesn't have modding um, you're not creating anything in the game so no Highly engaging subject matter, maybe. There are a lot of references, but we're creating a new IP, right? So looking at Magicka in the shape of Magicka 1 and 2, it doesn't really live up to these kind of pillars. And if you look at the kind of games pa Paradox did that I signed between after the success of Magicka, if you look at the Showdown effect, Dungeon Land, Empire, War of the Roses, uh, Salem, a bunch of these games are cool games and cool ideas, but they don't really follow this formula. And we really feel that this formula makes stronger business models, right? So do we have more Magicka stuff in place? I don't quite feel that Magicka lives up to these pillars. Not, in, not at least in the way that we've done Magicka thus far. So let me pitch a new idea. What if we would make Magicka that's more like Path of Exile or Warframe? Um, 
where we remove the reliance on a big linear story, mm -hmm. and the game is about you know replayable and going getting better loot and just you know grinding and yeah. doing fun stuff. We still have you know a hardcore component in the gameplay, but suddenly we've improved the re replayability at least. Maybe that's a game that has a ton of modding. Yeah. Right. So that would be one way of going about creating Magicka. I wouldn't call it an MMORPG. I wouldn't go that far, but you know. Just, just give it more meat. And we tried, you know, uh, you can fake replayability by making it just a multiplayer game and saying, you know, well, Team Fortress has infinite replayability or uh, Overwatch because it is multiplayer. But that's kind of cheating. and that's, it, it didn't really work. Uh, and also, it would probably need a different business model of free-to-play, which we're not that good at. So, uh, Magicka, probably not the way we've done it before. Uh, it doesn't really fit with what we're doing. And honestly, we've achieved a lot of great success following these religiously. If you look at Skylines, the biggest success in the company history, Stellaris, even a bigger success, uh, Hearts of Iron. So we've been sticking, the more we cl stick close to these, we, the better we do. And we'll, we'll, um, we'll see where we end up. Uh, Champs, we've been talking for 45 minutes. Fantastic. And I think uh, you have other things to do. Yes, is are we out of time? Did no, we, have we can minutes? we can do we can do some uh, we can do some more. I just wanted you to yeah you to know where we're at. Excellent. So yeah, exactly. I don't think I, I have a meeting at four ish, but it's not that important. This is much more fun. <laughs> uh, we should do like uh, the pitch uh, pitch Thursdays or something uh, back in the office. We tweet uh, when we're back. So we'll, we'll figure something out. So do we have any more final questions that we need to? Well, you go back to see if we miss anything in the thread. Yeah. Okay. So, I think there's more further down. Yeah, let's see. Mm. Oh, there's a lot of questions. Uh, with a lot of people publishing a game on Steam these days, what guidance would you offer to anyone coming to you with a game? Come to us before the game is released. Uh, the earlier we're involved, the better it is. Uh, we talked about the biggest mistakes, the weirdest pitches. Yes, a ton of pitches have been sent to me that I personally loved, but Paradox would never touch. Yeah, I mean, we, we were talking backstage about uh, game dev business, and yeah. that comes up sometimes. And you're like, oh, yeah. oh we can't do anything yeah, with yeah, this. Exactly. It's a shame. Uh, what genres are the most attractive to Paradox? Any genre that follows these pillars quite closely. And I can say that card games, for instance, do these. Card games are not good at creativity, but they have a lot of the other things. Mm -hmm. so the survival genre as a whole, definitely really hits it. Minecraft. Uh, I can give you an example of a number of games that are out there that are not Paradox games that would be considered Paradox games. Kerbal Space Program, perhaps the best example. Prison Architect. Uh, Don't Starve, my god. Such awesome. a good game. It, it's, it has the perfect Paradox fit in that sense. Uh, Football Manager. right? So those kind of games, uh, of course. Uh, XCOM in some ways. Um, so... In any given year, we might sign six games and maybe start one or two internally, maybe. Mm -hmm. But it differs, and sometimes uh, it, it changes, and we do more or less. Um, yeah, games that I would jump on immediately. Yeah, I like a, a good take on a theme hospital kind of thing. You know what? What I like theme hospital, but instead of hospitals, a police station. You're the chief of police. And you call in your detectives and you're like, Johnson! You chew them out and you send them off to missions and got to find minus, manage their salaries. You got corrupt cops. You got to expand the jail. It's very topical with mm -hmm. everything that's going on in yeah, the world. Get, getting some controversial. De depending on what type of police detectives you hire, of course, you're going to get a different feel to the stadium, uh, to the police station. Some like being shooed yeah. out, but that might lead to more corruption. Yeah. Do you invest in? Do you invest in like uh, body cams? How do you pair off the detectives? They have maybe you know a layer of uh, CK traits to them, yeah. so uh, you, you can get like Turner and Hooch in there, uh, a canine unit. Uh, the, the, you could do a shit ton of stuff with mm -hmm. it. As you can see, ideas are super cheap. Super simple, right? But getting this wrapped up and being able to present it to us with a production plan that makes sense and it looks good and the timing is well, it, it's hard, man. It's, uh, it's quite difficult. Banished is another great example of a paradox game that is not ours. I tried to get hold of that guy forever. He just doesn't reply emails. Um, so uh, RimWorld is another great example. Um... What else? Yeah. 
management. This is the police is too simple. It, it's it's a good example, but it's very shallow. Um, um, what else? There's you can go to our website and on on our website you can see what kind of information is required in a pitch. Um, yeah. Uh, I Factorio, my God, yes, Factorio is a great example. Uh, we we have one question here from uh, Sean that says, uh, do you give more than one chance for pitches that are oh, interesting yeah. slash viable? Yeah, and this you? this is the thing, right? I'm a human being, right? I'm I'm not this, you know. You're not pitching to Emperor Palpatine or Darth Vader, right? You can pitch something to me a hundred times. I'm probably going to tell you in firm, <laughs> in a firm yeah. way after the third time that this is not going to happen. But you can absolutely. We have a lot of people who pitch us a lot of stuff. Colossal Order went through like five pitches of uh, City Skylines before we said yes, and we wanted to work with them and make it right. So it's not about you know you get one shot. It's if you can trap me in that elevator <laughs> again, you can absolutely talk to me. Uh, but remember, I am not the only one, of course, that calls all the shots. We have a guy, Jacob, the 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 pretty boy that we have on, the pretty and smart boy. I'll tell him he's got the full package. That's in charge of our management games. When I get a management game, he is the first person I talk to. And I'm like, what do you think about this? Is Does this fit with your vision of where management games are going in the next three, five, ten years? And if it does, absolutely. Uh, we'll, we'll, take it, uh, we'll take it from there, right? Um, <laughs> I'm never taking the elevator again. Well, yeah. I mean, if it's a staircase pitch, it's just going to take longer and you'll get tired. Yeah. My business card says uh, head of the unicorn division. Because the game pitches that are suitable for us are truly unicorns, because they are that rare. Um, so it's uh, it's it's telling. But I am also the destroyer of dreams because we say no all the time, and I have a tiny vial of indie tears here. No, I don't have a vial, but it's I could mostly almost do it. And you know we talk about indies, but we're at the size now that we you know we work with developers like Obsidian. Colossal Order, they're in the they're they're the best in the industry at what they do, mm -hmm. and we work with more other developers of their caliber. And a few years ago, we did absolutely work with a lot of cool teams that were diamonds in the rough and maybe didn't have a, as a proven track record. But it's uh, it is it is what it is. Any final questions? Management games are dead. Like a management game for consoles would be interesting to entertain. Uh, for mobile, absolutely. Um, uh, it's a quick question from Lord. If we don't have a team, can we pitch game ideas for Paradox to no. develop instead? No, we're not interested no. in ideas. We're only interested in games that you actually yeah. can bring to I, life. And I've, I've seen the amount of ideas the Paradox development studio has. They don't need any more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, that just, uh, that's unfortunately the reality of it. Um, so uh, Oil Tycoon would be nice. Somebody writes something about Vampire the Masquerade. Yes, I can actually comment about not Vampire the Masquerade, but Vampire in general. Last year, in November, we bought White Wolf. Mm -hmm. And with it, we got like 20 cool IPs, ranging from Vampire the Masquerade to Mummy, the mummification or whatever it's called. Maybe not the strongest IP in that suit. Um, we have a crap ton of IPs that are cool that we don't quite have. We don't have plans for every single one. For some of them, we have very specific plans, maybe. Plausible deniability takes you far. Anyway, back to back to the thing. We'd love to see pitches on the White Wolf stuff. And if if you pitch something that's White Wolfish but doesn't suit Paradox, we'll still White Wolf will then take a look at it and then might find somebody else that can do it. Because White Wolf is in no way or form exclusive to Paradox. Um, so mm, hopefully Hopefully, yeah, that would be cool. Would you publish a Fallout-style RPG game made by Obsidian? A thousand times yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, a new, uh, uh, any chance for a new game like Warlock? I'm not going to say no. Uh, it would be cool. Uh, Warlock 2 got creamed utterly by, uh, by, what was it called? Number 3, by Triumph. Age of Mythology. No. Um, was it? Is it Age? It's no. Age of Wonder. Age of Wonder. Age of Wonder. Exactly. Um, we got creamed by that, and we're not unlikely to take them on because they should be all releasing the next one. Exalted is included in those IPs, and it's one of the weirder ones. It's anime, 
Have and you seen it? it? Yeah, I'm, it's so. I, weird, I know man. a lot of people that are super fans of Exalted. Yeah, I know. I'm not a fan of Exalted. I'm a fan of Adventure. Yeah, it's exactly. the best White Wolf. Uh, we already announced Victoria Three. Somebody's asking about it. It's being released next week. Um, right. In your charts of things you're looking for, there's no element called fun. How do you measure fun, if at all? Is fun just an abstraction? You know, it's a it's a good question because. <laughs> sometimes people we've been in a position where somebody sent us a milestone and we played and we tell them this isn't fun and they're like well nobody told us it was supposed to be fun <laughs> uh, hopefully we don't need to deal with that we understand the games aren't always fun throughout the development you know some are <laughs> you know it takes for a lot of the grand strategy games the fun kicks in very late in the process mm -hmm. uh, but that's uh, it's implied but we should be able to see the fun or at least imagine the fun uh, in, if somebody says FTL meets parts of the Caribbean. Okay, final questions. Uh, fun as a resource. A lot of good stuff. I have so many great ideas and I could write them, but as a writer without any capabilities of coding, yes. I urge you to create a mod. Most people can create a mod with a, a minimum of technical uh, skill. I would otherwise urge you to seek out other people in the chat or in the forums who actually know how to code but don't ha know how to write. Mm -hmm. And you can combine forces. Um, you can learn. But modding is a great way to get into the industry. Um, Majesty 3, somebody uh, asked about that earlier. Fred, for a while, he hounded me weekly about Majesty 3, and he was the only one that did. I think Rock Paper Shotgun, in one of the Rock Paper Shotgun comments, somebody said that Majesty that is that IP that Paradox doesn't let go of. Yeah, I mean, if you want to know more about Majesty, uh, Majesty just uh, post a question for uh, Fred, who's here tomorrow doing an AMA, and I'm sure he'll talk about it. At yeah, night. yeah. But, you know, what we liked about Majesty was that, weirdly enough, Majesty is called the Fantasy Kingdom Simulator, right? Mm -hmm. But Majesty 1 or 2 do a shit job of simulating what it would be like running a Fantasy Kingdom. Maybe somebody could create a mod for City Skylines that basically does what that would be. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, champs, it's it's time uh, to wrap to, it up. Yes, uh, to uh, say goodbye. Hopefully, uh, you guys watching have gotten uh, a lot of feedback and something out of this and an insight into how you're supposed to pitch your game to Paradox. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, with one more stream tonight at 6, which should be in about two hours, where it's just going to be some people here talking about what they've been doing at Gamescom. Uh, okay. Until then, goodbye. Live long and prosper. I have to, now I have to do this. The bit need of the many <laughs> outweigh the need of the few or the one.